I've been wanting to turn a big segmented sphere, and I was wondering what I should do. And I asked this question at dinner one night, and my wife very quickly suggested an eyeball. And I thought that was really cool. I could make the iris as a segmented piece and make the white of the eye as sort of a big, simple segmented sphere. So I found some wood in the shop, and this is the perfect kind of project to use, sort of odds and ends of pieces from past projects. So I have some cherry that I actually milled up locally, and I used the end of a piece of birch that I have that had a little bit more color to it, and I used a scrap piece of walnut that I had. And I'd use those three shades for the different colors of the iris. So the piece of cherry was really warped, and I had to joint and plane that piece. So what I would do is make a ring for the iris. And I found in looking at irises that it really was fairly similar to a segmented ring. It's as though the iris already has a radial texture to it. So making a fine segmented ring would work pretty well for the iris. So I cut my three colors of wood into strips, lots and lots and lots of strips. I could then glue those strips back together again into wider strips. And the wider strips would have a random arrangement of the three colors with the walnut falling at one end and the cherry falling at the other end. Now, I'm sure there's names for all of these different parts of the iris, but what I've noticed is that in a lot of people's eyes, the color is darker around the edge of the iris and then it's fairly light kind of in the middle of the ring of the iris. And then the part of the iris that's next to the pupil is then a little bit darker again. Now, of course, this isn't true for everyone, but it seemed to be something that, that kind of came up a lot. So I modeled my iris based on that, where I do the walnut towards the outside and the birch in the middle and the cherry towards the inside next to the pupil. And I made a bunch of strips with varying widths of those different colors and that sort of weak arrangement and I could plane two faces of those pieces once I had them glued up. Now, as they were somewhat random, they varied a little bit in height. So I wanted to cut these to all the same width, but I didn't do it in one pass. I sort of looked at each piece and decided how much of each color had to come off of each side. Not trying to make them the same, but just trying to make them within a certain range. So I slowly cut them down almost carving the, the widths to where I, I finally ended up with a final width. And I, I think it was about an inch and three quarters. And once I had a final width, I could then cut an angle into the, the wide side of each of these strips. So what I thought I'd do is a ring with 36 segments. And with that many segments, each segment has a 10 degree angle on it. So three, 360 divided by 36 gives you 10. So I angled the blade at 10 degrees and I made a new zero clearance insert plate for the table saw to fit that 10 degree angle as I was gonna have a lot of thin pieces going through the table saw. So I cut one and it actually worked pretty well. I was a little bit nervous about doing this much thickness on such a thin piece, but it seemed to be just fine. And the first one I did was just a little bit thick. I was shooting for 0.09 inches on the, on the narrow side, and you can see it's just a little bit thick. So I moved the fence just the tiniest little bit, and doing that made it just about right. So I cut the rest of the strips with that angle. So now those strips start to form an arc and I can cut those strips into short pieces. So normally when doing segments, if there is a normal, is that at this point I'd be cutting the angle. I can just cut these into shorter pieces. And I think I was doing an inch and a half. 
and that just makes a bunch of little pieces and I can arrange them randomly within the iris to get the pattern that I like. And once I did that, I could glue it together. I also wasn't sure how much of this strip material I was gonna need, so I made a bunch of it, and I ended up having enough for two irises. So what I ended up deciding is I could put an iris on each side of the eyeball. Now I had to work fast, so I was putting glue on every other piece on both sides, and then that would get glue into every single joint. And because there were so many pieces, I glued up half of it, then clamped it with the other half of unglued pieces, let those set up, then came back and glued the other half, and that worked. And then I can sand one side, and, and you can start to see the pattern. Now what I'd like to do is clean up the circle, or the outside edge, on the inside and the outside on the CNC machine so I can get a, a perfectly vertical cylinder out of this. The way I figured to hold it down to the CNC bed would be to glue the iris ring to a scrap piece of plywood. So while this dries, I can start making the segments for the white part of the eyeball. And these will just be big, simple segments. And I'll just make rings like I would for a bowl. So in doing this, I'll basically be making two bowls, or the, the two different sides of the eye. And I'll use maple for the white part of the eye. It was sort of the easiest light-colored wood I could get. It'd be cool to get holly for this, but that's harder to get. And it's harder to get this much of it. <laughs> but it's really, really white. So I can cut the maple into strips. And from the strips, I can start cutting the segments. And really, this is just a lot of cutting, as it's, it's really just a matter of keeping track of the length of each segment for each ring, and then gluing them together. And I did the same thing with these, where I put glue on every other segment, and that gets glue into every seam. Now, I don't have to spread it around too much, because this clamping with the, with the hose clamp gets a really, really tight seam. So the glue gets squished around into all the different parts of the seam from the clamping. My work table's gotten too lumpy from old glue bumps that I've started using this piece of our old kitchen as a nice, smooth, flat surface to glue on. And that actually seems to help. It keeps the rings nice and flat. So now that the rings are done, you can see how they're going to stack together to make the sphere of the eye. And the eye should be 10 inches in diameter, and each ring is an inch thick. So I have five rings on each side. So I sanded each ring so that they would go together with each other nicely. Now, I wanted to start by gluing the two rings nearest the iris together first, because I'm going to be cutting a hole into these that the iris will fit into. So I can glue these two rings together. And as those dry, I can start working on cleaning up the iris. So one thing I needed to be able to do is to find the exact center of the ring. So I cut a circle that's roughly the diameter of the iris ring, which I think is four and a half inches. And I put a hole, or a, basically a mark, right in the center of that circle. And I can now use that ring as a guide for centering the iris. So I can hold the iris down to the table with the plywood and I kind of did two screws and then a bunch of my wooden clamps. Then I can use the circle to find the center of the iris. And I put my bit into the hole of the circle. Then I could move it around until the circle was exactly centered over the iris. And once I did that, I could then set that as my zero, zero point. And when I clean up the iris, it's not lopsided and I can take off the same amount all the way around the ring. Now this could be done on the lathe, 
but doing it this way gives me a perfect cylinder. There isn't any variation in the height. And the seam from the top and the bottom will be the same. So I can cut out the hole for the pupil and it's basically just cleaning up the wall of the cylinder. So now the section of the whites of the eye that I need are ready. And I can put these down on the table and I can use that same circle again to, to find the center. Now this doesn't have to be quite as perfect as far as the center goes. Now I can mill out a hole for the iris to fit into. When I turn this, I'm gonna want that seam to be vertical and moving into the center of the sphere. I guess my point is, I don't wanna just glue the iris ring onto the outside of the sphere because that seam will, will run in the wrong direction and it'll give you sort of this really thin edge at the outer edge of the iris. Doing it this way, the iris goes into the actual volume of the sphere. Now I can cut the iris rings off the plywood. So I can glue the iris cylinder into the rings of the whites of the sphere of the eye. Now at this point, I'm kind of making a mistake before I know it, as I really should have pushed the iris rings in a little further but I will solve that in a minute. <laughs> so now I can glue up the rest of the sphere. And I'm doing this now because I need the hole where the pupil is going to work with my little clamp for clamping rings together. So while that dries, I can work on the pupil and I need to cut a cylinder out of the end of a piece of ebony and I don't quite have my vertical table set up yet on the CNC machine. So I freehanded a hole into one end of the table so I could put that piece of ebony endwise on the table or sort of clamp it vertically to the table. I'm kind of figuring the spoil board's getting more and more screwed up, so I'm not so worried about it anymore. So I did a test on a piece of birch and it seemed to work pretty well. So the test was both to see whether the way I was going to clamp it was going to work and whether the size of my cylinder was going to fit into the hole that I had cut into the iris. So once I had it all set up, I could then cut the cylinder into the ebony. And I've never worked with ebony before, so I wasn't sure how it was going to cut. And it actually is pretty nice. So I can take that off. I can cut that cylinder off on the radial arm saw. Now once the two halves of the sphere are dry, I can put the pupils in, and that's the last piece to go in. So now that everything's ready to turn, I left it in two halves, and what I wanted to do was to clean up the inside. So I started by doing the outside and kind of getting everything round. And once I had that ready, I could do the inside. And all I really want to do at this point is take the corners off of the rings. So I'm not really cutting into the volume of the, of the wood at this point. And it'd be nice if the inside were bigger and more hollow, but I wasn't sure how much material I was going to need and where I was going to need it. So I wanted to leave the wall thickness as big as I could at this point. Because I had not pushed the iris rings in all the way, I was using them to hold the bowl in place in the chuck on the lathe. But what I was beginning to wonder was whether I had left them too far out. And in looking at it put together, it just it didn't look round. It looked like it was too tall and skinny. So I took a photo of it and I drew a circle on it. It seemed that I was correct in my fear. As I, I moved that circle up and down to where it really should be on the ends, and it looked as though I was about one ring too tall. So what I decided I could do is take off half of the largest ring at the rim of the bowl 
and then glue that seam together as though those two half rings were one ring. And in doing this, this seemed to be closer to a sphere and it put the rings of the iris in the right place. Now in gluing the two halves together, I found my regular bar clamps were, were just long enough to fit into the center. Doing that glue up was actually really straightforward. And now I can do the final turning. So at this point I just started trying to make it close to a sphere. And I made another mistake at this point, too. I was thinking I was helping by removing some of the iris ring on the tailstock side. And really, I should have been trying to keep both ends the same. Because once I took the piece off to change the axis, I then had a very lopsided piece. So I was able to cut off some of the end that I had at the drive side of the lathe on the bandsaw but it was still fairly lopsided. So in doing a sphere, I've learned, you basically turn it on each of its three axes. So if you have, say, an X, a Y, and a Z axes on a sphere, you, you first turn one of the axes, and then you rotate it 90 degrees, and you turn it on the new axes, and then you rotate it to the third axes, and then you go back to the first, and you just sort of keep going through that loop until you get to a sphere. So after the first axis, you have to hold the sphere in a completely different way. And you do that by making a large cup at the drive side and a little cup at the tailstock side. And that allows you to hold the sphere sort of as a sphere, I guess, if that makes sense. So I made one of the middle-sized cups that I had a little smaller, and I trued it up and made it round as it tends to change over time if it's just sitting around. And this will allow me to hold the sphere at the new axes, which will be 90 degrees to the, to the first axes that I cut the sphere to. So you can see at this point how me not keeping the two ends similar ends up making the piece a little bit lopsided at this point. But it just means going a little slower to start. I was a little bit nervous about turning the iris as it's all end grain and a little bit harder to cut than side grain. But I took it really slow and I kept the tool really sharp and it seemed to be okay. Now in turning each of these axes, you don't want to take off too much. You really just want to take off the high spots. You sort of want to just carve to halfway between the high spots and the low spots. If you carve all the way down to a circle, you end up chasing your sphere all the way down to nothing. So you get it to where it's cut about halfway and then you rotate it and you cut the next axis and then you rotate it and you keep rotating and rotating. You actually fairly quickly get to a perfect sphere. I'm getting better with my shear cutting with the bowl gouge, which I think for this kind of work helps a lot. When doing a sphere, the, the grain direction is all over the place. You're not you're not cutting just one direction on the wood. And once I had it really close with the cutting tools, I could then sand. And in doing the sanding, I've been doing the same method where I'll do one axis and then rotate it and do another axis and rotate. And I've sanded it up to 600 grit. And it's almost shiny at this point. <laughs> so now I need to figure out a finish to put on it. But it turned out better than I had expected. It turned out really nice. In putting on a finish on the eye, I actually stopped at this point and I asked on Instagram what finish I should use. And I got about 250 responses, I think. I have every different variation of finish you can do. So these are the parameters I wanted. I didn't want anything that was going to darken the maple, but I did want something that would darken the iris and bring the variation in the different woods in the iris out. The pupil is ebony, 
and I guess from what I've read a lot of oil finishes don't work with tropical hardwoods especially ebony I guess the oil in the wood reacts with the oil in the finish and it causes it not to cure so it sort of never dries although I did do a little test piece with some tongue oil and it seemed to be fine so I'm not sure how true that is <laughs> So what I ended up doing was something new for me, which I also kind of liked, was to do shellac as a base coat and wax as a top coat. So I did two layers of shellac and I sanded in between. And I sanded after the second coat of shellac up to 2000 grit and added the wax. And once the wax was dry, I then buffed that and it gave it a nice shine. So what I was after was a shine that didn't look like there was a coating on the piece. I think the, the water-based finishes I've found kind of feel like the piece is wrapped in plastic, like there's a layer of something on there. Although I'm sure I'll get an argument about that. <laughs> so I think this actually turned out pretty nice. It's shiny, but it doesn't feel like there's a thick layer on the piece. And it pulls the color variation out of the iris, but it didn't change the color of the maple at all. It feels like it's a perfectly clear finish. So it turned out really nice. This is actually better than I thought it was going to be. And I'm amazed that I got the end grain of the iris to turn so well. Thanks for watching.